The US government is especially callous in Nevada, where nuclear tests are conducted. We must take risks, calculated risks, it is true, but risks nevertheless. The greatest risk factor during nuclear testing is the weather. Wind can be treacherous. If it blows in the wrong direction, radiation hits one's own troops. After the explosion, the radioactive cloud drifts across the countryside. During one of the desert tests, radioactive smoke blows into Snow Canyon National Park. There, it contaminates the sand. Only one year later, the shoot of a monumental costume drama begins. In The Conqueror, John Wayne plays Genghis Khan. Hundreds of Native American extras of the Paiute tribe play the Mongolian hordes. During the riding stunts, contaminated sand is kicked up. One of the last Paiute extras from The Conqueror Still Alive is Bud Myers. Certain days they had, like, say, like, the riding past the cameras and things like that. And then they showed a battle scene, you know, you had a, with a sword and, and the dust churned up pretty, the horses, they can kick up a lot of dust. Even two horses, you know, near mud. 40, 50 of them, it's a big old, like a big old windstorm coming through after it's over. In 1980, a reporter investigates the fate of the Conqueror's cast and crew. Of 220 people, 91 developed cancer, of whom 46 died, including John Wayne, Susan Hayward, the leading actress, and director Dick Powell. This statistic does not include the Piot extras. Many of them died of cancer. I had my father, he was out here, and he, he was riding a horse too. He died of cancer. I had two brothers died of cancer, and a, a younger sister died of cancer. But many of the guys I know that are my age who works here, they're all gone. Bud Myers meets Claudia Peterson, who grew up near the test sites. She witnessed the nuclear tests of the 50s and 60s as a child. Her fate resembles his. The reservation down here in Nevada, you know, it's almost straight across from close, you know, to the test site by air miles, you know, mm -hmm. you just right over there. And you could, you wouldn't see the, especially at, when they tested that night, it just light up the whole area, like brighter than the mm -hmm. sun. Well, here in St. George, a lot of the people, when they announced a test, they would, if it was an early morning test or an evening test, they would go up to the highest bluffs with a picnic with their families and they would all sit out there. It was an event that it was like going to the fireworks on the 4th of July. They would all take picnics and their children go up there and wait and watch the tests come. And they let them do that. They knew they were doing that. The part that was so hard about it was that 
your own government, our own government, considered us a low-use segment of the population. We were expendable. We didn't matter. That's the hardest part for me to swallow. <laughs> In the early days, I think there was not uh, as full an appreciation of the consequences of being exposed to radiation. And there was a view that these nuclear tests were uh, critical to ensuring the security of one's populace. And so I think in combination, these factors led to foolhardy behavior. Claudia Peterson grew up on a farm. There, she witnessed long-term effects of radiation on DNA. Being on a farm, our neighbors were sheep herders. And I remember at lambing season, every spring, just piles of deformed, two-headed, just deformed baby lambs, dead piles. And I thought that was normal. I remember thinking it's so sad that so many baby lambs die. The truth was, not only animals are affected. We were in a small community in Cedar. There were probably 30, 40 kids my age in our class. Darwin Hoyt died of leukemia. And then a year later, one of our classmates uh, got bone cancer and they had to amputate his leg. And he died like a year later. I remember going to those funerals as a child, thinking, how do children die like this? Studies proved an increase in some forms of cancer in communities close to the nuclear test sites. The effects of radiation are also felt in the next generation. There is an inexplicable increase in deaths in Claudia's family too. Among them is her six-year-old daughter, Bethany. When she was three, she got sick, and um, I took her to about five doctors who kept telling me nothing was wrong, and I knew something was wrong. And I finally, I just, uh, my mother and I took her to Salt Lake, and I said, something is wrong with my child, and nobody will listen to me. And they admitted her in the hospital that night and said they'd do some tests. And then I heard a nurse say something about, possible neuroblastoma. So I go down to the hospital library and I'm digging through all the stuff and everything I read said fatal, fatal, fatal. We don't have cancer anywhere in our family. My mother was the oldest of 11 children. I don't have an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, still don't, that um, has had cancer. And my sister had died, my dad had died from a brain tumor and now my daughter was dying. Hematologist came in and he said, it's, it's fallout. This is related from what you were exposed to. All the therapies carried out on Bethany failed. She'd started having some sepsis and I said, call her doctor. Came over and he said, how far do you want to take this? I said, I'm, we're not doing one more thing to this child. She's, she's suffered enough, so we got to just love on her and hold her till she passed away. 